Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone. Thank you guys for joining. Um, my name is Aisha Rahim. I am a member of the Worcester Islamic community here. And we have a very important session tonight. Um, I know everybody has been probably listening to various uh, speakers and leaders around the country uh, concerning Black Lives Matter. Um, we as a community thought that it would be important to address how this directly affects not only Worcester, not only our community, but the Muslim community specifically. Um, with that being said, you know, tonight's topic is how did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in racism? You know, mashallah, we had um, we have a great example in him in so many things. So, you know, I'll jump right to it. Okay. So today we have our wonderful Imam Asif uh, Hirani. Um, we have Mufti Ikram al Haq from Masjid al Salam who will be joining us today. And Brother Stephen Shakir, he's the um, Muslim chaplain in Shirley, Massachusetts. I don't know if you guys want to take um, 30 seconds to give a brief introduction um, about yourselves as well, please. So I would say, Brother Stephen Shakir, you can start. Assalamu alaikum to the my name is Stephen Shakir. I've been a member of the Worcester community, ISPW, since its conception. Uh, I've been a Muslim chaplain. I've been the treasurer of ISCW. I've been the president. I've been on numerous committees. I've spoken numerous conferences. So that's just a little, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mufti Kram, you can introduce yourself. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Ikram al Haq, and I serve as the resident imam and resident scholar at Masjid al Islam. I have been here for over 15 years now. Uh, Alhamdulillah. I have been serving the community in different roles, in different capacities, and it's an honor for me to join all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this gathering a blessed gathering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this gathering a beneficial one for all of us and for everyone who is listening, for everyone who is watching, for everyone who is virtually with us at this moment, inshallah. Um, this is your brother Atif Hirani from Worcester Islamic Center. So I'm local here, uh, and uh, I'm in Worcester, Massachusetts, for last almost two years and few months now. Um, and Alhamdulillah, I'm blessed that I'm part of such a beautiful community, and I'm so honored that I'm joined with uh, uh, Mufti Kram and uh, brother Steve Shakir and sister Aisha. Okay, welcome, Mark. Sister Aisha, if you can introduce yourself also. Okay, I mean, I am Sister Aisha. Who I um, moved to Worcester about three years ago from the D.C. area, um, where I was also pretty active there. Um, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm here. I don't, I don't have to give too many details. I don't want people to uh, approach me with too many questions just yet. <laughs> So inshallah, we'll, we'll, we'll jump right to it, inshallah. Um, so again, just as a reminder, tonight's topic is how did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in racism, okay? So we'll begin with just kind of having a background of how structural racism existed in pre-Islamic Arabia. So that's my first question to you guys is, can you remind and describe how racism, whether it be an individual or structurally, how what did that look like before the Prophet came in pre-Islamic Arabia? And we'll start with um, you, uh, Mufti Akam, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I would rather uh, uh, let Imam Asif or uh, Brother. Uh, Steve Shakir uh, do the opening inshallah and then I'll just uh, join 
Inshallah. We can't hear you, Imam Asif. <laughs> Let's start with Brother Steve, inshallah. He's the most senior in the community of Worcester. Let's start with him, inshallah. inshallah. Well, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, first, I want to uh, start with what, what Allah gives us in the Quran. And what Allah gives us in the Quran is, starts with Iblis. And he asks Iblis to prostrate to Adam and he refuses to prostrate to Adam. So he says, what, what is wrong with you, Iblis? He said, it's, it's tobacco. It's, ta, it's takbara, right? It's takbara, right? What are you doing to seek yourself? Make yourself big, right? Make yourself more important. So I think that he, to uh, understanding how racism or superiority complex come. So in Arabia, you 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 didn't have slavery or racism as you see it in today's world, because in those world people became slaves due to several processes, mostly war or debt. It wasn't color. It wasn't until maybe around the 1850s until we seen this kind of group classification of in, uh, sup, sup, super, uh, superiority and inferiority. So that's that's what I would would start with right there. That, no, I that's how Arabia was. Arabia was tribes. You, I'm better than you. My tribe's better than you. Uh, wars. You, you became slave from wars. And debt owing. So I'll just leave that and let someone else add other uh, things to it if they please. Mufti Karam, please go ahead. Then I will add, inshallah. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Jazakumullah uh, khair, brothers. Uh, Steve, for giving us the opening from the Quran. I will add another ayah of the Quran to our discussion on the same subject matter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ In, in Surah Al-Isra, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا Which translates as we have certainly honored the children of Adam and carried them on the land and sea and provided good things for them. And we favored them over much of what we have created with decisive preference. This ayah categorically establishes the honor that Allah has bestowed upon the progeny of Adam alayhi not only Adam alayhi salam, Adam alayhi salam was of course honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Adam alayhi salam, Khalaqtuhu biyadayya. I created him with my own hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not say that about anyone else in the entire universe that I created that person with my own hands. But Adam alayhi salam is a single being in the entire universe who's created by the blessed hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are the progeny of Adam alayhi salam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly honored Adam alayhi salam. And through him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly honored all of us. So that, that includes every son and daughter of Adam alayhi salam. There is no exclusion. If you look at the words, they are all inclusive. Banu Adam. As long as you are from the humankind, you are included in this, in this honor. If you are not in humankind, you're, if you're not a human being, then yes, you're not part of this honor that Allah has bestowed upon the children of Adam alayhi upon the progeny of Adam alayhi salam. But that includes all of us. It does not distinguish us 
uh, by race. It does not discriminate against anyone based on their race, based on their color, based on their uh, level of wealth, based on their level of power, based on their gender. Every gender of the uh, children of Adam salam, every person, every member of the progeny of Adam salam, is honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to maintain that honor. We have to give each person the honor that they deserve, that Allah has given to them. We are not the ones giving this honor to uh, anybody. It's Allah who has given it to all of us. So we have to respect that. We have to be mindful of that. And we have to give the same honor to every single human, human being, extend the same dignity to every single human being that Allah has entitled them to. Jazakallah, brother Stephen uh, Mufti Ikram. Um, do I really have to add something because they both uh, have uh, uh, said all the points which were in my mind? Or do you want to move to the next question? Well, I don't know if you guys answered my question about racism, though. You know, I understand that, um, you know, these, you know, this is what Allah says in the Quran. And, um, you know, we have different hadith. But, you know, if, if we're going to talk about <laughs> How the Prophet وسلم, ended racism, we have to address that racism was something that existed, um, something that still exists. So I think um, it would be very difficult for me to ask my next questions if we don't really um, first address, you know, the first question of what did racism, you know, look like in pre-Islamic Arabia? So, you know, that's, if anybody I can... I thought I, I thought I had that for you because in Arabia at that time it wasn't based on color. People became slaves due to war and debt. So Service. so that so there's so, there's so, slavery. It wasn't, so, no, hold on, hold on. So race is talking about a race of people. Racism is talking about a race, right? A group, not individuals. So in, in, in the time of Prophet Muhammad there was there was there was no racism per se as we see racism now. Okay, so I can rephrase the question, inshallah. So how were black Arabs treated differently than Arabs who were of a lighter, less affected by the sun skin tone? <laughs> How is there, was there any difference? I mean, how were, how were black Arabs treated differently? If they happened to be the majority of people who might've been captured for one reason or another. I don't know, maybe someone else can answer this but because it wasn't based on skin color. It was based on tribal, it was tribalism. It wasn't skin color. If you was of a superior tribe, it didn't matter what your color was in that tribe, you was of that superior tribe. I mean, when they went to uh, uh, the King Najashi, they didn't mistreat him because he was dark skin. Yes, and he was a they king. They treaties with him, they did service with him, all right? But he still was dark skin, he's dark, he still was dark skin. And if you're talking about racism, as I said before, racism is dealing with labeling a whole group of people as inferior based on their skin color. That's the concept of racism in our world today. That wasn't the concept. Racism, I don't believe, was in the in the uh, uh, before the the Prophet Sallallahu and in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu It was due to tribalism. Okay, and I, I, do, I do respect, I do respect um, your stance there, mashallah, and um, I, I definitely respect that stance. I also um, know that there are certain hadith that, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu he gently corrected his companions when they would say, you know, something like, you know, son of a black woman, you know, as an insult. So when examples of that are um, brought about, then there does indicate that um, you know, that there was some level of, I don't know if you want to call it racism, but I will call it racism or anti-blackness in, you know, the Arabic culture. So 
So if anyone else feels comfortable um, addressing that, please do. Well, there is, uh, if we study that period of our history closely, we learn that Arabs generally associated black people, people from Africa with uh, slavery. Most of the people that they enslaved in Arabia, they were from Africa. And this culture continued in even the immediate uh, uh, period preceding the emergence of Islam. And from even though if we look at uh, from the color perspective, most of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they were either very brown or they were dark. If we read the, the color description of Ali radiallahu and we read the color description of Umar radiallahu they were not white. Even their skin color was not white. From race, of course, they were not white. But even their skin color was not white. They were either really dark brown or they were dark. But they were not considered slaves because their lineage did not uh, trace back to Africa. Those whose lineage somehow traced back to Africa, like Bilal radiallahu an and some other companions from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi they were looked at as the sons of slaves or uh, the children of slaves because they came from there. And in, in, the, in the initial days, uh, even, uh, e even some companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi they were not able to completely get rid of this uh, uh, this uh, ha this characteristics that they had developed in their early years of their life. Now we have to understand that when it comes to racism, no one is born to be racist. You don't you don't uh, you don't uh, start acting as a racist from day one of your life or even day 10 or day you know 300 of your life but the environment that you are being raised in the parents that are raising you the the kids that you are growing up around the environment that you're growing up in that environment will influence your development you will under you will develop these uh uh, these ideas, you will develop these influences that, okay, black people are inferior, white people are superior, black people are this, white people are that. And unfortunately, this is something that uh, that is a result of the culture, that is a result of the environment, not the result of the religion. Alhamdulillah, our religion has taught us the, the most beautiful things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran, Ya ayyuhan nasu attaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida. O, o mankind, fear your Lord, the one who created you from a single soul. We all go back to one soul, and that is the soul of Adam alayhi salam. It's like looking at it from this perspective. You have a large family, let's say one you know one parents they have 10 children and in those 10 children some are black some are white some have brown color now are they going to use that color to discriminate against each other no because they understand that they are the same family they're the same blood at the end of the day so we have to understand the same thing that as humanity, we are one, one family. We're, we're this one large family where we have over 7 billion members, but we all go back to the same parents, Adam alayhi salam and Hawa alayhi salam. MashaAllah, Jazakno khair. Ma'am um, Asif, I'm gonna give you a, a quick second to speak. I just wanted to quickly say to combine both Mufti Akram and Stephen Shakir's answers regarding, um, it's not, I don't believe it's completely um, just the African lineage and there was tribalism because to say that the camp companions didn't have African um, 
uh, ancestry and their lineage and they were just happened to be dark from magic, you know, I think that's also a little bit taking it to one extreme. So I just wanted to point that out too, that yes, some of the companions did have African lineage. They were from Africa and some of them were slaves. So some of the lineage was washed down and their Arab lineage uh, dominated and that's where the tribalism comes in. So I just wanted to, um, you know, point that out. So Imam Asif, please. Yeah, so uh, beautifully explained by actually three of you. Sister Aisha, you're doing a great job, mashallah, and Mufti Akram and uh, Brother Steve. I just want to uh, add something which both of the esteemed uh, panelists have said. Uh, it actually depends on how you define racism, because um, there are actually multiple definitions of racism if you check the dictionary. Um, if, if you define racism, um, if it is just that one individual dislike other individual because of his skin color, then it can never be finished because it's an individual behavior. And as Brother Steve said about uh, Iblis was the first racist person, <laughs> uh, first racist individual. Uh, so ever since hum humanity have put the uh, foot on the ground, you have this racist mentality there, uh, which who say, he said, Ana khayrum min, uh, Ana khayrum min, that I'm better than him because of the so-and-so reason. Uh, but um, if you define racism, not only as an individual dislike uh, on the basis of a skin color, but if you define racism as a system, institutionalized racism, as we have in our country, we are one group of people think that they are superior because of their skin color and the other group is inferior because of their skin color and they should be marginalized, they should not get proper human rights because of their skin color, then yes, this is systematic racism and it's a poison for any society. And we might argue that uh, back in the days before pre-Islamic era, was there a racism for the sake of racism or tribalism? But it might have different names, but the psyche was there. Uh, and that's why uh, Mufti Ikram was pointing out and uh, Brother Steven Sajrasha was pointing out that there was an individual incident as we we'll talk, I'm pretty sure we talk about that. They were keep coming. And that is why Prophet Muhammad came from the first day until his last speech. He spoke about this, whether you call it tribalism, whether you call it racism, in Islam, we call it as jahiliya, ignorance, um, to take priority whether as an individual or as a group and think I'm superior based on my skin color, another person is inferior based on his skin color, this is considered as jahiliya, that's Islamic term. Obviously we can use racism, tribalism, uh, we can do the research, but yes, there was uh, a concept um, and Islam used different term for that. I hope this answers the question. Yes, thank you for everyone's um, responses, okay. Um, so the questions that I have prepared are going to be a little switched up now. Um, you know, alhamdulillah, thanks to everyone's responses. Um, so my next question was really like, how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam implement different societal reforms to decrease this concept of racism, whether it's tribalism, racism, superiority, one form or another, but when there were instances of, um, you know, overt acts of racism. And, and, I, and I do appreciate Brother Shakir uh, pointing out the slavery aspect because that it's actually two different topics. Um, there were different reforms that the Prophet had uh, to eradicate slavery. Um, and unfortunately, um, as Mufti Akram mentioned, we have to get away from associating slavery and blackness as one and the same thing. You know, so let's just address the first thing of what did the Prophet ﷺ do to actually implement different reforms in his society at the time to squash the concept that somebody is better than one person based on something that is beyond their own control. How did, let's, let's just put it like that. I don't know, did you guys understand what I'm asking? I hope it's clear. Brother Shakir, would you like to take that one first? Well, always going back to the Quran because the Prophet وسلم, is the demonstrator, he's the model for taking the Quran and implementing it in society. So Allah says in the Quran, He says, 
لقد كلقنا الإنسان في عسن تقوي Allah said we have created, we have indeed created man in the best of modes. So the Prophet وسلم, his emphasis to mankind was the excellence of the human nature. As the brother Mufti was telling us, this is the nature of all human beings, have this excellent nature that Allah has given us. And the only time it becomes corrupted is when we lose faith in Allah and we lose our way. And then Allah sends a man back to bring us back to that excellence, that excellence that we have inside. The excellence is not based on color. Color is, uh, is a very insignificant thing. Color is based on an environmental factor. But the, the human being is the excellence that Allah has given it or put in it for the opportunity, for its advancement, for, for its development, for its livelihood, all of that. So we have to push the excellence in the, the human being. And this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. He raised up the excellence, not the skin color, not the tribe. He raised the human being that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created when he created Adam. Oh, that's someone else. Add mm -hmm. some. Imam Asif, please. Yeah, so uh, beautiful response by Brother Steve Shakir. So how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a reformer ended this uh, or uh, eradicated this institutionalized or structural racism, what we were discussing previously. You know, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke about the Quran, Brother Steve, so I'll tell you about his seerah, that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did everything from the day one to say that black and white are equal. Uh, the, the master of Bilal radiallahu and Umayyah ibn Khalf. So basically he his teachings for humanity is equal. Bilal and Umayyah are equal in terms of human rights. And that is why that is why the leaders of Makkah at that time hated Islam because they were the beneficiaries of that racist society. Uh, so so that is why they were even hating Islam. Um, they uh, then he didn't only preach throughout the Quran and Sunnah about how racism is bad. But even, and especially in his final khutbah, uh, we all know that subhanAllah that he gave a speech, he said that his final khutbah that the white is not superior over black and vice versa and Arab is not superior over the non-Arab and vice versa. But instead of just preaching, which is extremely important, he proved it from his actions. Uh, many a times we can uh, preach, but it's without actions. So uh, he even manifested uh, the evil of racism and how to apply the policies um, as a leader of the community to eradicate racism. So appointing Bilal radiallahu anh, as a muaddin, appointing Osama ibn Zaid radiallahu anh, a black companion to lead the army against the people of Syria, Romans, um, uh, telling people that if they want to marry the woman of paradise, they should consider marry Umm Ayman, another black woman. Uh, he was the one who sent marriage proposal for the black companion Saad bin al Aswad to the woman known for her beauty. And when Saad asked Prophet that uh, if we all are equal, O Prophet, uh, then why the Arabs won't let their daughter marry me? And then later, Prophet Muhammad cried for the same companion, the black companion, and he was martyred. Basically, he gave the, these people uh, equal rights, not only with his speeches, but even his actions. And that is what we need. Um, uh, we have education, one aspect, because to combat ignorance of racism, we need to educate our communities. But it's time about deforming communities. It's time about how many uh, people within our communities uh, are, change, are, are focusing on changing, changing and diversifying, subhanAllah. And that is where we need to head, because that's the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu <laughs> Thank you, Imam Asif. Uh, Mufti Ikram, do you have anything to add? Uh, nothing really to add, but I will share uh, two hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that are very important to understand in this regard. In one hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Inna Allah Ta'ala khalaqa Adama min qabdatin qabadaha min jami'il ard. 
فجاء بنو آدم على قدر الأرض فجاء منهم الأحمر والأبيض والأسود وبين ذلك والسهل والحزن والخبيث والطيب The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that Allah created Adam from a handful of soil which he took from the entire earth. So the children of Adam come in accordance with the earth. Some come with red skin, some come with white skin, some come with black skin, and whatever is in between, thin, thick, dirty, and clean. So that reminds us of again what we started the discussion about how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, manifesting his power by creating us in different colors in different uh, heights in different genders all of that takes us back to the signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to these things as ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم. And it is amongst the signs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He created the heavens and the earth, and He created different languages and different colors. Our the different color of skin that we have, the different language we have. As a matter of fact, it is a blessing of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It is a manifestation of the great powers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lastly, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in one hadith, Ya ayyuhal nas, in ala, inna rabbakum wahid, wa inna abakum wahid, ala, la fadla li arabiyin ala a'jamiyin, wa la li a'jamiyin ala arabiyin, wa la li ahmar ala aswad, wa la aswad ala ahmar, illa bit taqwa. O people, your Lord is one. And your father, Adam, is one. There is no favor of an Arab over a foreigner. There is no superiority of an Arab over uh, a non-Arab. And there is no superiority of a non-Arab over an Arab, nor of a white person over a black person, nor a black person over a white person, except by righteousness. This is the only standard that the Prophet ﷺ established to determine who is better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, we're all equal. Our colors don't make a difference. And as Imam Asif highlighted the few examples in the seerah of our beloved Prophet ﷺ, look, the closest companion of the Prophet, someone who literally walked with the Prophet every single day and every single night is Bilal. He is the personal bookkeeper of the Prophet, the personal treasurer of the Prophet. You know who would keep the pocket money of the Prophet? Bilal. Anything that the Prophet had, his the Prophet pockets were always empty. Whatever money he would get, he would give it to Bilal radiallahu anhu. Bilal radiallahu would keep an account of that. Whenever a needy would come and ask for help, the Prophet sallallahu would ask Bilal, Oh Bilal, is there anything that we have? If there was something that was in possession of Bilal radiallahu an, uh, Bilal radiallahu would answer in positive and the Prophet sallallahu would say, yes, give it, give it away. And the Prophet sallallahu would also remind Bilal radiallahu an not to fear poverty. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives. And if you give for the sake of Allah, Allah will not abandon you. Allah will not leave you in poverty if you are doing something for the sake of Allah to help someone else. So if we if we study the seerah of the Prophet, وسلم, we understand very clearly the, the beautiful examples, the brilliant examples that the Prophet وسلم, left behind for us. And the the training that he did for his companions how he trained abu bakr radiallahu an how he trained umar radiallahu an how he trained ali radiallahu an how he trained uthman radiallahu an they reflected that same attitude of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in their examples as well when they became in power whether it is abu bakr radiallahu an or umar radiallahu an 
we can go into their lives and we find the manifestation of that equality in their lives as well. Unfortunately, as time passed by and we moved away from Khilafat al Rashida, from, uh, uh, from the Khilafa that was in succession to the, uh, to the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we moved away from that to the monarchy, then things began to change. Then uh, uh, tribalism once again started coming back then racism started coming back as well. So we have to go back to our roots. We have to go back to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu his teachings and Quran to eliminate that element of racism. And, how, and we do not need to think that if it changes from the, uh, from the top, uh, from the, uh, the White House or from the governorship or whatever, then it will change. No, you start changing from your own uh, level, wherever you are. Every one of us, we have our own powers that Allah has given us, our own responsibility that Allah has given us. So we start from where we are and then take the change from there because it has to be a change of the society where we begin to think and we where we begin to understand that we're all equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, uh, we, we, we do believe in the slogan of Abraham Lincoln and others uh, that uh, all men are equal, but it's not really equal. It has never been seen as equal. There have always been dividers, divisions of power, divisions of money, divisions of wealth, divisions of uh, cultural influences that have always kept us divided. Mashallah, Jazakallah khair, Mufti Akram. Um, you touched on a lot in that answer, um, a lot, Mashallah. Um, I don't know if I want to ask something uh, from your question or if, if did everyone get a chance to address my question already? Yes. So, well, Mufti Akram, Mashallah, the way you described um, Bilal radiallahu an was very beautiful. I am looking forward to a... Uh, session of other black companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Hopefully you can, um, you know, enlighten us and give such beautiful descriptions for other companions as well. Um, and <laughs> I learned from my imam. <laughs> I always have to get the next session ready. Um, now you, at the very beginning of your answer, you um, were talking about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that we um, recognize in his farewell sermon. And you, described a lot of the things that he said, but um, the why is, is the question. You know, I know when people are in their last days, when they're, you know, on their deathbed, they say the things that are so, so important to them that they want to, you know, move forward for the next generations to come. You know, we look at his farewell, the Prophet Sallallahu farewell sermon. He didn't talk about what? don't don't drink alcohol he didn't say uh don't uh you know or even he didn't say make sure you guys become half of the quran you know something that we all take pride in doing he didn't say make sure you wear hijab you know these weren't things that he talked about in his farewell sermon you know just to elucidate you know this point like in surah al-baqarah when uh yaqub alayhi salam was on his deathbed what did he say to his children you know all he said to them you know who will you worship after me? What will you worship when I'm gone? You know, so just to elucidate, that's what's on his mind when he's dying, the most important thing. So going back to the Prophet and back to this whole concept of inferiority, superiority, he dressed, he obviously addressed other things too that are very important. But some of the things that we focus on as Muslims, he did not address in his farewell sermon. So why is it that he took a good, you know, several sections of his farewell sermon before saying, did I convey the message? Did he talk about no Arab is superior over another Arab? No black is superior over white or white superior over black? Why? You know, why did he use that time to say that? Uh, Brother Shakir, would you like to start this one, please? 
Oh, and one more thing. Um, we have about oh, no. 20 minutes left. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, so we'll just keep that in mind for our answers as well. Go ahead, Brother Shakir Saad. Well, the Prophet ﷺ is considered the Rahmat al -Nas. He's a mercy to all the world. So he comes to remove the burden that is going to affect the whole world. What's going to affect the whole world is the things that he pointed out in his last speech. How we treat women, races, all those isms. And those are the things that are affecting us today. It, uh, uh, us uh, wearing, uh, sisters wearing hijab, that's not an issue. For us wearing hijab, for praying, praying is not an issue for us. For memorizing Quran, that's not an issue. He spoke on those issues that were going to affect mankind because he is mercy. He's the he is called the uh, uh, Uswatin Hassanatin. He's the model, the path to follow, to remove all of these sicknesses that are pervading our environment. So that's why I, that's my thoughts on that. Absolutely. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, Brother Shakir. Imam Asif, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, just quickly, Brother Steve Shakir said, I just want to, uh, first of all, repeat that uh, as your question is that uh, he didn't address Muslim issues about wearing hijab is particular to Muslim. It's important for Muslim women, but obviously not for non-Muslim. It's about praying five times a day uh, is actually important for Muslim community. So he gave a message because now Muslim community, when he was giving a serious speech, he's talking to thousands and thousands of companions. And now Muslim community is becoming a global uh, religion. So now he have to convey the message, which will be a, a solution for the global pandemic. So he have to provide a solution that, okay, make sure that uh, you don't take superiority based on your skin color, based on your background. We all are equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to give that global message. Uh, that is why he gave importance to that. Second, um, I personally think from a sociological standpoint, this is a beautiful, beautiful timing, subhanAllah. A Muslim community um, is becoming as diverse as it was in Medina, uh, Mecca and Medina at that time. So you have Bilal origin is from Abyssinia, Salman origin is from uh, Faras, Soheb origin is from Rome. You have people in Mecca, people in Medina, and then they even had so many disagreements. So you had such a diverse community and to keep them together, to keep them united, to keep make sure that they stay together, you have to give this lesson at such an important occasion that no one is superior based on their skin color. We all are equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are brothers and sisters if we say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah under that one banner. So that message have to be delivered at such an important time subhanAllah. And there are many other wisdoms and I'll keep it short inshallah. Thank you, Imam Asif. Um, Mufti Akram, please. I would just, uh, uh, there's no need to add after Brother Steve and Imam Asif uh, have said about this, but I will just add one more point. This sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu which is called the Farewell Sermon, it is a universal message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already informed the Prophet وسلم, that he is the prophet for the humanity. Unlike his predecessors like Isa alayhi salam who was for Jews, uh, Musa alayhi salam, and other prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were sent to a specific community, a specific group of people. The Prophet وسلم, was sent for the entire humanity. We sent you for all the people without any exception. So that's why the Prophet وسلم, he highlighted the issues of the humanity that he could foresee with his uh, uh, insight of uh, prophethood that the humanity was going to get uh, bogged down with. 
today we're actually facing those challenges that the Prophet ﷺ warned us about. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya ayyuhun nas, inna allaha qad adhaba ankum ubayyat al jahiliya wa ta'adhumaha bi abaiha fannasu rajulan barrun taqiyun kareemun ala Allah wa fajirun shaqiyun hadinun ala Allah wa nasu banu adam wa khalaq allahu adam min tu'ab قال الله تعالى يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى. Oh people, Allah has removed the slogans of ignorance from you and the exaltation of its forefathers. The people are only two kinds: either a righteous, God-fearing believer, dignified to Allah, or a wicked, miserable sinner, insignificant to Allah. The people are all the children of Adam, and Adam was created from dust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh people, we have created you male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. So we're taken back to our roots because this is the only way we can understand our issues and we can come to resolutions otherwise shaitan is doing everything in his power and in his experience to divide us to pit us against each other the divided we are the more we become uh, bogged down in conflicts with each other the more success shaitan claims and the more we find our roots, the more we find our platform of unity as one community, the community of Adam alayhi salam, the progeny of Adam alayhi salam, the more, uh, the more disgraced and humiliated shaitan becomes. Jazakum khair. So yeah, Sayyidina, we sounds like everyone pretty much agrees that in his farewell sermon that the Prophet was addressing humanity, it sounds like all of you all um, touched upon that, that he wasn't just addressing Muslims, he was addressing everybody, that it was it's a, a humanity problem, this concept of inferiority and superiority. Um, now, I have one more, we have about 10 more minutes. Um, I have one question before we have some closing, um, closing comments. Um, I'm just going to read this here. Uh, so African-American Muslim psychologist, Dr. Ray, um, sorry, I just lost it. Dr. Ray Brock Murray explains that we as Muslims, we understand that, yes, pork is haram, that alcohol is haram, fornication is haram, right? And people, Muslims may feel like engaging in this these acts, but they don't, right? Because why Allah forbids it. So, but when it comes to racial oppression, something that's also not allowed in Islam, people still tend to do it much more widely. It's it's accepted. And I just want to ask, like, do you have any practical tips on what we can do to get there so that when people mention when people are committing something racist, it's a detect detestable act. How do how do we get there? You know? And then do you think that this may be a step towards eradicating racism? Um, if anybody, if you guys can just kind of comment about one minute on it, if you have any any um, any answers to that. I know that's a tough question, but you know that's why we're here. <laughs> yes, brother. Shikha. Well, assalamu alaikum. I would I would uh, I would just bring to people's attention that we talk about. Uh, Fitna. Allah allow fitna because Allah wants to test us. Allah wants to test us to bring out the excellence that He has put in the human being. So, but if we give ourselves to weaknesses and we give ourselves to greed and all these other things that will oppress the excellent nature that Allah has created. We'll never get to that purity like you put gold through gold going through a fire to get off the impurities. So we just have to do start with ourselves first. 
And this is what the prophet did. One, one person at a time he taught. And it spread out. And people, he encouraged the people to treat people, to bring out the excellence in each other. I don't want to take up too much time if someone else has something else. Thank you, Brother Shakir. Imam or Mufti, would you like to add? Yeah, I just want to, um, Mufti Sabi, do you want to go or do you want, Mufti Sabi, if you can. Oh yeah, inshallah, and jazakallah khairan. Well, it's so embarrassing, mashallah, both are so seniors than, than me and I'm, I'm there as a student, subhanAllah. Uh, just quickly, I want to add uh, two things. As you said that, um, that everyone know that alcohol is haram, fornication is haram, and we try to stay away because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do. And we hope that inshallah our youth will be protected from alcohol and zina. Ameen, Ya Rab. But why don't people stay away from racism? Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, obviously when it's haram and, and there's so many evidence for it. Um, how can we get people, um, uh, pe how can we create awareness in the people? So just two things. One is education. And second is implementing or manifesting that. First is education. Some people doesn't even think that it's haram. At the basic, at the jokes, you cannot finish racism out from outside when you have racism in your heart and racism within your own family. Uh, it's almost, it's also haram to use N word. It's also haram to have racist jokes. It's also haram in some cultures they use the word, uh, like like in some cultures they use the word black to even insult someone. That's actually haram to use that tone. Once we were going to educate, once we were going to give khutbah and our eventually entire activism work will be on that direction, then people will think, okay, this is also haram and we should make sure that ourselves, our kids will um, stay away from this kind of racism. The first is education, because remember, Prophet Muhammad says this is ignorant. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad said that this is actually kind of ignorance and you cannot treat ignorance, you cannot give solution to the ignorance without educating. Second thing we need to do, um, we need to have actions. Means that there is no point of giving speeches and educating and workshops if you're not willing to change yourself. Uh, what if, if I'm from Pakistan, let's say originally, and my kids were going to say, okay, we uh, there is an African-American brother or sister who wants to propose my son or my daughter. And if at that time, I would just deny that individual, despite of the fact they are practicing Muslim, just because they are from these countries or this is skin color, then I am part of the problem. I cannot solve the problem because racism is here. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very blunt, but we need to do two things to eradicate this from our society. One is education, second is by actions and by practice. Mufti Sahib, please add, inshallah. I will second Imam Asif on both points, inshallah. I will add to that, uh, with education, we have to understand that a lot of times, now, it's, it's not your fault if you were raised in an environment where people put it in your head that some by by nature are inferior to you and you are superior to them by nature it's not your fault but once you begin to understand once you begin to learn that it is wrong then try to actively or perhaps proactively tackle that issue address that issue you don't have to be uh, you don't have to have racism in you only if you are going to say it to somebody or act on it. Even if it's even if it's in your heart and you're just saying these words when nobody is watching you, when nobody is listening to you, Allah is always watching you. Allah is always listening to you. Allah is always recording every action of yours. Try to eliminate that from your heart. Try to remind yourself that I am no better than my black brother or sister. I am no better than my white brother or sister. I am no better than my brown brother and sister. Because in the, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ta we're all children of Adam alayhi salam. 
the only thing that will make us superior in the sight of Allah is taqwa. And who knows about the level of taqwa that is in your heart? Because taqwa is not worn on your on your body. Taqwa is not in your head. Taqwa is not in your dress. Taqwa is not in your watch. Taqwa is inside your heart. And who knows what's in your in your heart? Allah alone. Not not even your spouse knows what's in your heart. Not even your parents know what's in your heart. Allah alone knows what's in your heart. So if you understand, as I said, you don't have to feel guilty that, oh, I'm racist. But if you come to understand that, yes, there is an element of uh, bias, prejudice, racism in your heart, then try to address it sooner rather than later. Try to actively or proactively get rid of it from your heart by doing things that will oppose it, inshallah. Mashallah, very, very wonderful answers. Um, just to kind of summarize that, so it sounds like we need to exercise our anti-racism muscles. You know, you guys all go to the gym and you it takes time. It takes time to work. It's being mindful when you have a racist thought that comes across, oh, uh, I don't want to, I'd rather wear, oh, there's nobody here for me to sit next to because nobody looks like me. How about sitting next to someone who doesn't look like me? That's exercising that uncomfortable anti-prejudice, anti-racism muscle. It, it will take discomfort at the end, just like starting anything new. Um, so inshallah, if we can, you know, hopefully, start to address that now. Just to kind of close this up, you know, we all came together because of everything going on around the country, around us, you know, around the Black Lives Movement. Um, and we, again, addressing this because we have racism in the Muslim Ummah. We have racism in our very own community, okay? So I'm just putting it out there. It's a fact. And we're here to address it, okay? Um, but we want to end on positive notes. We, we do want to end on something positive. And I want to ask if any of you all have any words of hope for, I, I broke it into two categories. You can address either one, okay? So the first one is because I have Muslim friends who you know, reverted to Islam. And a lot of the reason why they came to Islam is because they thought racism isn't here. So once they enter Islam, though, it's a completely different picture. And this utopian view that they have of Muslims is shattered very quickly. When they go to maybe the wrong masjid, they don't know. They just see Muslims are Muslims. They go to one masjid and they're totally not welcome. So what are words of hope for Muslims who, ex you know, for especially reverts who experience that and they're very discouraged. And, you know, and I will add this, that a lot, you know, I just spoke to my friend this morning and, you know, in New Jersey, for example, there's a lot of shiuch who have African-American Muslims coming to them and they're now going to African uh, ancestral religions for none other than the reason of the racism that they experience amongst Muslims, okay? So that goes to the next question. What are the words of hope for those Muslim brothers and sisters who have experienced racism at the hands of other Muslims. So this is how we're going to, um, inshallah, hopefully tie up um, our session today. Well, I, I got two things to say, hopefully not too long. Muhammad was a bashirun and he was a nadirun. He was a bringer of good news to people that believe and do the good works. Have faith and do the good works. If action can take us out of religion, then how much faith do we have? Then he was, he's a warner, right? Uh, let me finish. Do the good work. What's the good works going to lead us to? Good works are going to lead us to the Jannah, the, the God in which rivers flow underneath. This is what Allah say to uh, bosses with uh, pure, beautiful. Uh, com uh, pure, beautiful spouses, right? If that's what we want, then we have to follow the, the example of Muhammad the Prophet, وسلم, and we have to uh, stay firm, just like the Prophet stayed firm with all the name calling he was getting. He was called madman and everything else. 
So I'm just going to stop it there. Let someone else. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so Jazakallah um, Khairan, Brother Steve. And actually, I would say first, before I can answer this question, Dr. Aisha, you have done an amazing job, mashallah. And Jazakallah Khairan, Mufti Kram, and Brother Steve for your time and participation. Just quickly, what can we do? Um, we need to have zero tolerance against racism in our communities. Zero tolerance. Uh, you know, there, there's a famous hadith. One person came, one companion, he had a drinking habit. He came for a repentance. He asked Rasulullah to repent on his behalf. Rasulullah repented. It happened quite often. And when Rasulullah was asked, why don't you curse this person? He's not giving importance to your tawbah. And Rasulullah says, In wa Rasulullah. This person loves Allah and his messenger. He comes every now and then to repent. How can I curse him? Um, but when it comes to any racist comment or any comment based on superiority on the skin color, there have to be zero tolerance. We all know the incident of Abu Dhar Ghaffari an, with Bilal radiallahu an, where this ha incident happened and Rasulullah immediately, immediately responded to say, Ya Abu Dhar, inna ka umrun fi ka jahiliya. Same Abu Dhar, in another hadith, Prophet Muhammad says that you are the Isa of this Ummah in terms of spirituality. But when racism incident like this happened, there was a zero tolerance because Rasulullah wanted, Sallallahu wanted to close door for all of us that there is no way, there is zero tolerance for racism. That's what we have to do. If in our community, if there is any incident of racism is reported and it's proven, then leadership should take a strong action to um, lead from the front. That's one thing we need to do. Second, um, most of our leadership is not diverse enough. We need to get diversify. And our African-American brother, our, our black brothers and sisters, we need to give them leadership positions in our community. Uh, so that's what we need to do. So to make it more inclusive, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Sister Aisha for doing a wonderful job. Uh, brother Steve and Imam Asif. I would like to say in closing remarks, uh, it is a sad reality in many places throughout this country, and not just throughout this country, but in many places around the world, where those who come into Islam hoping that they will find the best that they had hoped for in people, unfortunately, they don't find that best in people. Now, they do find the best in religion. They do find the best in Quran. They do find the best in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But when it comes to the contemporaries, when it comes to the uh, Muslim men and women, they don't often find the best in them. And that's very discouraging. That's very heartbreaking. I would say to such brothers and sisters that Instead of being, uh, instead of turning away because you see something that's that's not up to your expectation, I would try to do something to bring a positive change. I would become part of the positive change because that's what Islam has taught us. Islam has has not taught us the attitude of defeat. Islam has taught us the attitude of uh, taking up the challenges and facing the challenges and then making every situation into a better situation, turning every situation into a better situation. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown you the light, then don't go away with that light. Take that light and show that light to others. Maybe others will see the light and they will follow the light as well, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair, mashallah. Um, I'm really, really um, honored to have been here today um, um, in such a wonderful gathering. And um, I appreciate everyone um, joining us and your answers, mashallah, just to sum up to your final responses about what we can do moving forward. Um, definitely looking to the Prophet وسلم, as an example, because he too faced hardship. Um, always remembering there's always an example in the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, and taking action in the community. When you see acts of racism, if you experience it, 
let someone know, okay? You don't have to suffer silently. It's not accepted, it's not tolerated, um, and it won't be accepted in our community. And the Imam Asif has just let us know, it's not accepted here, it's not accepting Islam, but we will implement you know, a no tolerance policy also as the example of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and yes, uh, and Mufti Akram also briefly reminded us that, you know, it's Allah who fulfills us at the end of the day, you know, yes, we, we will, we do need, um, you know, people to, you know, we're social beings, but, you know, Allah tests us in different ways and perhaps through these tests, we turn to him even more and that may make us become more of a light and inshallah, we can spread that light to others and not let what other people do discourage us um, at the end of the day. I am so, so blessed to have, you know, been here tonight, this evening and um, mashallah. Um, I don't know if anyone, um, if Mufti Akram, if you can please give us some closing dua. Inshallah. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك اللهم اجعل جمعنا هذا جمعا مرحوما واجعل تفرقنا من بعده تفرقا معصوما اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يدل من واليت ولا يعز من عليك فارك ربنا وتعاليت نستغفرك اللهم ونتوب إليك اللهم استر عوراتنا وآمر روعاتنا اللهم احفظنا من بين أيدينا ومن خلفنا وعن يميننا وعن شمالنا ومن فوقنا وأن نغتال من تحتنا يا الله forgive us يا الله forgive our shortcomings يا الله forgive our mistakes يا الله make this make this gathering a blessed one accept this from us والله reward the ones who participated in this gathering in any way who organized this gathering who helped bringing this gathering into reality O oh Allah, reward the moderator, reward the panelists. O oh Allah, forgive all of us. O oh Allah, we ask you to show us the light. O oh Allah, we ask you to enable us to remain steadfast on Islam, to spread the message of Islam, to spread the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to spread them, to spread the message of Quran. Oh Allah, allow us and enable us to practice upon the beautiful teachings of Quran and the beautiful teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Oh Allah, protect us, protect our families, protect our loved ones, protect our children, protect the whole humanity from this virus, from the coronavirus. Oh Allah, protect all of us. Oh Allah, heal those who are suffering. Oh Allah, give relief to those who are suffering. Oh Allah, give relief to those who are from poverty, from sickness, from illness, from hardship, or from anything else. O oh Allah, give them relief. O oh Allah, fill this world with peace. O oh Allah, fill, with, fill this world with peace. O oh Allah, we ask you to make us the true ambassadors of Islam, the true message bearers of Islam. Muhammad, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana wa qina adam al nar ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم والله give us the ability to understand that we are the children of Adam عليه السلام give us the ability to understand that we are all equal give us the ability to understand and treat each other with respect and dignity that they deserve والله give us the understanding that all of us are equal give us the understanding that all of us are the children of Adam alayhi salam, our race doesn't matter, our color doesn't matter, our level of wealth doesn't matter, our nationalities don't matter. We're all children of Adam alayhi salam. Give us a true understanding of our roots, give us a true understanding of our humanity so we can become the servants of humanity. Rabbana taqabbul minna inna kanta s-sami'u al-alim wa tub alina inna kanta t-tawabu al-rahim wa sallallahu ta'ala ala akhari khalqi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabi ajma'in rahmatika wa arhamar rahim
جزاك الله خير السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته